So briefly, before we get into peer respite specifically, we just wanted to make sure that y'all are aware of who we are. So we are the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community. I'm just gonna, I'm not a huge fan of reading slides to people, but I generally do read this slide just so people can both see and hear what our mission statement is. So the Western Mass RLC supports healing and empowerment for our broader communities and people who have been impacted by psychiatric diagnosis, trauma, extreme states, homelessness, problems with substances, and other life interesting challenges through peer-to-peer -peer support and genuine human relationships, alternative healing practices, learning opportunities, and advocacy. Essential to our work is recognizing and undoing systemic injustices such as racism, sexism, ableism, transphobia, trans misogyny, and psychiatric oppression. Now, just really briefly, I want to say this was not our original mission statement when we first became funded in 2007. We had a much smaller focus of our mission statement that just talked about peer support and developing peer support networks. And we changed the mission statement in three different ways. One was to really broaden how we defined who this community was for, because as I'm sure most of you know, like none of us fit neatly into any one box. We often get put in boxes because of a particular treatment system that we enter or get pushed into, but we're much more complicated people. <laughs> we have lots of different experiences and our community is richer for recognizing that and being open to that. So that's one thing that we changed. The next thing we changed was the reality that you know, peer support is really great, but it's not on its own going to change the world if we're not also looking at public opinion and learning and all sorts of different opportunities. And so we really shifted, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And then the last piece that you see there is the recognition of systemic oppression. So many of us who struggle in these different ways have experienced many hardships in our lives, and a lot of that does connect to various kinds of systemic oppression. We thought it was really important to name that up front as a part of our mission statement. As far as those four different pieces I said I would say a little bit more about, we do identify as having four arms or parts or pieces, however you want to think about it. I like the arm graphic because it's creepy and it stays in people's memory for that reason. Not everyone agrees with me on the team, so sometimes you'll see a different slide here. <laughs> so just quickly, the four parts are Individual and systems advocacy, which sometimes looks like just going with someone to an appointment, because of course, if you were with someone at an appointment, that appointment sometimes goes way differently than if that person is there alone, just the knowledge that someone else is in there. But a lot of the time, it's about much more broadly making sure people know their rights, making sure that we have relationships with disability rights lawyers and can really keep people informed on the reality that they can ask why and say no to things, although sometimes it experience consequences for doing that. And sometimes that's about knowing that if it's too much of a risk for someone to say no on their own, we can all come together as a whole community and say no in these really, really powerful ways that can sometimes help people refine the spark in them that gets lost. So that's another piece. Alternative healing practices, that's probably our least funded area, but we do have this piece where we try and make available uh, opportunities to say get acupuncture or do yoga or Reiki or anything that our community can come up with, not because we think it is the right choice, but because we think choice is a having choice, different opportunities to do different things. And we have a consultation and learning opportunities piece, which is part of what brings us here. It's sort of a link between consultation and learning opportunities and the individual peer support. Those are our two best funded areas, and they kind of drive each other. We do the work in person in our peer-to-peer -peer support part, and we learn from it, and we learn from our community, and then we often find ways to offer that learning to others in the form of books or trainings or videos, one of which you'll see today, right? Our peer support piece though is absolutely our most funded piece and that is where a number of supports sit from the Hearing Voices family groups, family and friend groups that Cindy Marty was just talking about to Hearing Voices groups, alternatives to suicide groups, any number of groups. We have four community centers. We have some grants we give out to people who have ideas for, that they want to develop for personal projects or career initiatives. And then of course that's where our peer respite sits. Now, 
This is AFIA's mission. Now, AFIA is our peer respite. It has been funded since 2012. And I'm just going to read this briefly to you as well since it's our mission statement. So AFIA strives to provide a safer space in which each person can find the balance and support needed to turn what is so often referred to as a crisis into a learning and growth opportunity. Now, for those of you who have done the IPS thing, Hopefully you see the alignment there. IPS, when I say IPS, I'm referring to intentional peer support and then it gets acronymed into IPS. Now intentional peer support is really centered on this idea that crisis or what gets called crisis doesn't have to be this horrible devastating thing that we just are constantly trying to avoid. It can be a transformational time. And that is what we take into these peer respites is this idea is that we can learn and we can grow especially if you're supported by people who can ask the right questions or just be with you in some of the darkness that you're moving through. Now this is where we're going to watch the film and I'm going to be quiet. So you're going to hear from many more voices than just mine and Cindy's at this point. This is about a 20 minute film. We are going to go through it all because I think it's going to give you a lot of the meat that you know we could ramble at you about but I think this is just a much more dynamic way to get this information across. So here we go. Respite is a non-clinical environment set up specifically to support people going through difficult times to avoid hospital, move through their distress, and toward a better place. It is developed, led, and run by people who themselves have been diagnosed, hospitalized, and or experienced trauma. In truth, the idea of creating a sort of home away from home in which to help people avoid psychiatric hospitalization has been going on for several decades. One early effort was the Crisis Hostel in Ithaca, New York around about 1993. While not entirely peer-to-peer, -peer, the hostel was a huge step in that direction. In truth, to be considered a pure peer respite, all team members must identify as having had their own experiences, including those in leadership roles. And if the house is part of a larger organization, it's not a clinical one and is governed by a board where people with personal experience are also strongly represented. By that definition, the first peer respite was Stepping Stones, developed in Claremont, New Hampshire in 1995 by Sherry Mead and friends. By 2012, there were about a dozen pure and hybrid peer respites throughout the country. And then there was a fear. Lucky number 13. Afia was officially born on Saturday, August the 4th, 2012 in Northampton, Massachusetts. A group called the Groundhogs, yes, I said it, the Groundhogs, was actually visioning and advocating for respites in Massachusetts for several years before. So when it finally happened, everyone was more than ready to go. The team had been told to expect things to start out slowly, but someone came to stay that very first day, and the house has been full almost ever since. Sometimes we learn the most by examining the myths. So now, for all that is not true about peer respites, we go to field correspondent Andy Boreski for this edition of Mythbusters. Peer respites are a place for people who just need a little rest, not for people in serious distress. Mm -hmm. 
so many people are walking around this world pretending like everything's okay until they just can't pretend anymore. And rather than being a place that you go when everything is okay, a peer respite is really meant to be a place that you go where you can be real about just how bad things are sometimes. The people who've come in needing places to feel have been wonderful, regrouping for a week and going back with coping strategies on how to interact. I spent a lot of energy sort of showing up in the world and putting my happy face on and pretending that everything was okay when in fact it was anything but okay. So that was a really big turning point in terms of being at Athea was this sort of, I got introduced to the idea that there could be a place to go and there could be people in the world where I could be authentic. The main difference between a peer respite and a clinical respite is the identity of the people working there. It's like some people think you can just exchange out a clinical worker for someone in a peer role, pay them less, plunk them down in the same house using the same approaches and call it a peer respite. And you know, I've been doing this work for several years now and it's just a lot more than that. Everybody in the universe has lived experience, everyone. So I'm willing to bet that all of the clinicians, therapists, you name it, at these traditional respites also have lived experience. So it isn't about just having that lived experience. It's about actually sitting down with someone who's in distress and really putting aside all of your judgment and just being with them, human being to human being. It's about that connection because maybe it's the first time that somebody's really even listened to them and not sat there and labeled them or told them what they should do or immediately jumped to problem solving, giving advice or being afraid of them even. A respite house can't possibly be safe if there's no clinicians present to assess the risks. So almost across the board, the people who are having the hardest time in the house or who the house is having the hardest time with are people who have been pushed to come by clinicians. And it's not that we think clinical workers are bad people or that we don't want them telling people about a fear, but simple involvement of clinicians is not where safety is created. I've seen plenty of hospitals where like people like do some real damage to themselves. And I think the, the difference is, is like, you know, am, I'm not saying I have never had the thought to injure myself in a PIA or a respite, peer respite, but like the chance of me doing it, I think is much greater in the hospital because I don't feel like a connection to any of the people there. If people can still go to work or a group in the community, then they can't be in that serious distress. A man staring back at me. So there's this funny gap in the system, the way it's set up right now. Many community supports will tell people who are talking about killing themselves that their feelings are too big and that they need to call a crisis and go to the hospital. But calling crisis and going to the hospital too many times can have dramatic impact on people's lives, their family, their work, everything. And so they can end up in a worse place than where they started. That's not up for someone else to decide whether you're able to work or not. And so at AFIA, we allow people to do whatever it is that they want to do. Like, and it's not even about us allowing, it's about them allowing themselves to decide and self-determine what's going to work for them and what they hope to get out of their stay. The big part is I was able to continue working and um, that being really valuable. Um, one of the hardest parts for me about going into a hospital is this, as soon as you go there, you're kind of putting your life on pause. I feel like a feel works with you. Like, oh, you have work to do? Well, you better go to that because maybe not having to like worry about having your rent paid might, you know, go figure, help your mental status. Like if you're already feeling stressed out, they're feeling like, hey, guess what? You could take two weeks off, but you're not gonna have a place to live and you're gonna be fired from your job. And you know, might not help. The best thing for people who are thinking about killing themselves is to be in a locked unit where they can't cause themselves harm, not a peer respite where they're free to come and go.
sometimes when people want to make someone safe, they end up putting them in the hospital. But often the only person who ends up feeling better is the person who put them there because they feel like they've done their duty. And the person who's forced into the hospital can end up feeling like no one cares and no one's really paying attention to what they actually need. And then you have a peer respite where maybe some are concerned that someone's not safe because they're not being controlled, but what if they're actually doing better? What's challenging for me has been taking people out of what I call an institutionalized model. That some people come through a fear with a certain learned helplessness about when I get angry, somebody else is supposed to close me down, lock me down, put me in a padded room. If I say I'm going to kill myself, that's supposed to get your attention so that you will strategize for me what I need to do next. I've had people in a lot of distress who I've been talking to and suddenly I'll just say, you know, I know that whenever I feel like I want to kill myself and they'll just stop me right there, right before I can even get through the sentence and be like, wait, you've wanted to kill yourself before? You still want to kill yourself sometimes? And yes, I think that a lot of people, maybe even most people have been in that space before and being able to realize that you're not alone, that there are other people out there who felt that way and who maybe still feel that way, that maybe this isn't something that you just go through for a brief period. Maybe it's a constant negotiation that you're making with yourself and knowing that there are other people who are there who will support you during those times and who will just be there and hear you that can be incredibly transforming and you're not going to find that on a locked ward. Peer respites across the country vary in a number of ways, including who can stay and for how long. At AFIA, just about anyone in the region who is 18 or older and experiencing significant emotional or mental distress is welcome to have a conversation with someone working at the house about whether or not AFIA is a good fit especially if they are trying to avoid hospitalization or other more restrictive interventions. If everyone involved decides it is a fit, then the person is able to stay up to one week. While there, anyone staying can expect access to their own private room and community spaces. Peer-to-peer -peer support focused on turning crisis into a learning opportunity, resource information, and the ability to connect freely with the broader community. In fact, AFIA is connected to the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community, or RLC. The RLC is a large network of people working within four branches advocacy and activism, alternative healing practices, training and consultation, and peer-to-peer -peer supports. This last branch is, of course, where AFIA sits. The RLC also operates within a values-based framework and that definitely applies at AFIA. Everyone working or staying at the house is asked to be personally responsible for taking part in holding values like self-determination, mutuality, creating a healing environment, and respect. Some may say that that's too much to expect of someone going through a hard time, but this reflects their belief that people are still capable, even when struggling, and it's critical to who we are and how we work. I didn't know what to expect, but because of the way I was treated on the phone, I felt comfortable in being here. Afia not being in a hospital and not being, you know, in a, you know, big, huge, intimidating brick wall building and actually just being a house in a neighborhood is refreshing. I thought the setup was great. I like my room. The room was really nice and big and big bed that I wouldn't normally be able to sleep in. So it was nice and comforting. It's beautiful, but also homey. So it's not like you see something beautiful and, oh, I can't touch that. From playing the guitar if you need it, to uh, artwork or uh, you can express any, anything you'd like here. Uh, and you have the freedom to come and go. So if one is up for, you know, going out and exploring and then coming back to a safe and predictable environment, they can do that. I'm not secluding myself from the outside world. It, it makes me feel like I'm part of a home. I'm part of a family. A family that I don't have anymore. And knowing 
how muddy and messy the clinical respites can be is a little scary. The packet they hand you on your first day in is like 30 pages thick, so you're experiencing crisis and you're expected to read this packet, sign on to these rules, go into this facility and recover. It was so much easier to call and say, I'm having a hard time. Then the times I have called crisis, where it's been about, you know, what drug have you taken at what age? When's the last time you did it? And were you ever sexually abused? You know, and, you know, when's the last time you've been to detox? You know, that whole conversation is so long and painful. If I didn't feel horrible in the beginning, I would feel horrible by the end. Because I was in crisis, and I'd only started with a new therapist the first time for one meeting, and I had written to her an email, let her know what was happening. And she emailed me back and said, because you're in crisis, essentially, I'm shortening it, but it, because you're in crisis, I can no longer be your therapist. I was stunned, absolutely stunned. And I, that just sent me into a further uh, loop of crisis. So I was at this point of uh, facing involuntary commitment and I had um, slowly got off my medication and things had gone well for a while, but now I was hitting a bumpy spot and the bumpy spot was getting tougher and tougher and uh, my service providers were like, you know, we've given you a while, things aren't getting better, we think you need to go back to the hospital. So at one point, when you know when I was getting the ultimatum, I just ran and hid in the woods. And um, things were not getting better. And I really wanted to have a chance to see if I could go through this ex extreme state without going to the hospital. Because when I've gone to the hospital, you know, not only did I have to recover from that extreme state, I had to recover from the trauma of having been in the hospital. You know, I didn't know if it would work, but I wanted the chance to see if I could try a different way to get through this experience. And I was able to go to a FIA and um, be in my extreme state and sleep odd hours and, you know, be able to have a coherent conversation and not be able to have a coherent conversation. And what I discovered was that I could go through an extreme state without being extremely medicated and it really forced me to try to look at different strategies. When I went there, people said, what can we do to help you? And that kind of freaked me out because normally people would say, this is what you need to do. We'll put you on this medication, da 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 and Instead, I had to experiment and see what was helpful for me and I learned a lot about how to manage those experiences in a more self-directed way. We worked out this thing at AFIA where each of my kids came and uh, the people working there were able to sit and talk with us and I didn't feel like people were on two different sides. It wasn't about, you know, how to make Marty compliant. It was more like how to make this work. and. What does everybody in this group need? And we were able to negotiate that, and uh, that was something that had never happened in the past. We've definitely had our share of challenges, navigating team communication, uh, talking with providers when they're upset because we can't tell them what they want to know about somebody, scheduling complexities, all the normal day-to-day -day stuff. And then our biggest challenge came in the form of physical violence. We all knew that violence could happen absolutely anywhere, but we also knew as a peer-to-peer -peer support that we were particularly vulnerable to people's judgments and interpretations of why. I'm in a culture that wants to have 100% assurance that life is safe. Life isn't safe. It never has been. I don't think we can make it. And in some ways, it may feel like it's getting more unsafe to many people. We are trying our best to create a safe environment. 
We can't promise 100%, but no one can. So if someone staying at the house attacked someone who was working there in a pretty serious way during the process of a theft, and the broader community started making assumptions about why, for instance, was it because we didn't have clinicians around assessing people? And if I'm honest, we started to get scared ourselves and started to wonder if we were fundamentally doing something that was off, where our value is off somehow. And it's hard to get over, you know, whether we approach it from a place of optimism or pessimism, it, it happened. And that's that stinks. So the truth is that that particular person did come to us through a clinician who had just assessed him and was urging him to come check out the house. It's not how it usually works, but it is what happened in that situation. And we actually think that that was part of the problem because he wasn't invested in being in the house himself. So what we ended up realizing is that our values are even more important than we thought. Values like self-determination and mutuality can make all the difference in someone really wanting to be in the house and taking some responsibility for how they are when they're there. So we started to reflect on what that meant for how we were doing things. Right when we reopened, someone came in who'd been there a few times, and when I was sitting down with them and going over everything, they said to me, they're like, you know, I heard about what happened, and I was wondering how things were going to change and be different, and now I can kind of see. And I was like, yeah, you know, we're, we're talking a lot more about the values and about what we do and about, you know, just how things work here. And he said to me, well, I always feel like these things were unspoken. And I said, yeah, well, now we're definitely speaking to it. So when something bad happens, you have basically two choices. You can let it tear you apart, change you. You can become something else entirely. Or you can use it as an opportunity to learn and get stronger. And, you know, we chose the latter. If we're the community that we say we are, and I think we are, then when these things happen, it's an opportunity to grow. And we are growing, and we are getting stronger. And all you need to do is look around at our community to know that that's true. really important part of the healing experience to become a part of a non-judgmental, fully accepting community. The best way I've been able to recover, I guess, is people around me that just let me be who I am and kind of experience what I'm going through and are reflective in that process so I don't get trapped. For me, the biggest thing is uh, respect. I think that, that, that's key in a space like that, is to feel respected, is to be able to get respect, give respect. I think that it, uh, that leads to be able to uh, feel comfortable and uh, really be able to relate with each other in a different kind of way. Right? That we're all there for different reasons, or able to respect our differences and still come together and you know assist each other in in healing. And that's what was great about uh, Afia specifically. They're very good listeners. Uh, they really don't tell you what to do, but point you in the right direction. So you really have to step up to the plate and do your own thing and uh, make it happen for yourself. What I have done is I've been able to find full-time work and I think that speaks volumes. I can't emphasize enough what it feels like to get back to work. It's dignity, it's honor, it's pride. Um, it's, it's amazing and um, I really would like to thank everybody uh, at the AFIA House and the uh, RLC. They knew I was facing forced commitment and um but somehow they weren't you know freaked out about that and they didn't know, need to know you know every chart written on me in my you know 20 year history of in and out of things and i really felt like it was someone relating to me as a fellow human being going through a hard time
So I'm not going to run us through the credits, but I'm going to turn it over to Cindy Marty to just talk about the film with you a little bit. Hey, everybody. Um, you know, maybe people can put uh, questions in the chat. For me, one of the amazing things that happened at AFIA was somebody asked me, you know, what, if anything, is helpful when you're in the hospital? Is there a part of that that, that is actually helpful? And, um, and can we recreate that without you having to go? And I really didn't like uh, the answer that I had, but it was the truth. There, there was something helpful about uh, being locked in a room for three days. And uh, what they told me was, well, you have a room here. And you can shut the door and you can lock it from the inside. And uh, it, it kind of put all this power into me that normally would be taken away from me in seeking treatment. Um, and for me, that this whole idea of just shutting everything off and uh, feeling um, safe, safe meaning um, that there's love and care around me but it's my choice how much I want to interact. Uh, you know, it's, it's a skill now, a uh, strategy that I've used for years now. So when things are overwhelming, sometimes unplugging and yet still feeling connected really helps me out a lot. And I'm trying to see if there's uh, any particular questions people have. So, uh, there is one about how to respond to clinicians who are basically saying you got to be prepared for the violence or, you know, you're being naive and more is going to happen, that stuff. Well, you know what's amazing is I do, I've run a, a peer run groups inside locked psychiatric units. And the amazing thing is when you're not trying to exercise power over people, there's a whole lot less violence you know i am not it's not my role to make anybody do anything and uh this whole idea of of being curious if somebody's angry for instance i don't know if this has happened to anybody you know I, i'm upset about something and then i get told calm down does that help me calm down no but if somebody says, I can see you're angry, do you want to talk about what you're angry about? So in fact, there's a lot less uh, conflict because there's a lot less uh, powering over people. At least, you know, that that's my experience. This is a voluntary thing that somebody self-determines whether this is a good idea, whether they want to stay, whether they want to go. And instead of uh, people trying to push you around and tell you what to do. It is more about, you know, what would you like to do and how can we support you in that? Yeah, I, I would just add to that, you know, for the person I think, Nibel, uh, who asked that question. I, I think one thing to bear in mind is that's just not what we're seeing. And so, you know, peer respites have been around for quite some time and there's more like 30-ish of them at this point in this country. And we are one of the older ones, but certainly not the oldest by any stretch. Uh, you know, others have been around, as the film said, for quite a while. And there actually just hasn't been violence. So one of the things, one of the ways I would respond is if you've been through intentional peer support training or, or other trains that include, encourage you to use sort of curiosity questions is to, instead of just arguing with that person, ask them why they believe that. Ask them where they get that idea. And if if they'd be interested in looking at some of the actual research with you and talking that through, or, you know, also starting some of those conversations, maybe pulling some of the threads that Cindy Marty just offered around, you know, when, when does violence happen? You know, when is it most likely to happen? And because in my experience, it's most likely to happen when there are power struggles, when there are people feeling like they aren't going to get their needs met unless they sort of fight for them. And, in general, the system, a lot of people feel a real loss of control and power when they enter the system and peer respites are a place where that doesn't need to happen. And so actually the risk of violence in my experience and according to the data is just much higher in those environments where the power and control are getting taken. So 
So if you can engage someone and asking them questions rather than sort of going back and forth with them, often it tends to be much more successful. And sometimes people ask that kind of question, it, it's almost like asked in a vacuum. Like the scale is, you know, no violence and, and violence and pure respite. But as, as Sarah's talking about, you know, it, in a psychiatric unit, my experience over 20 years, there is far more violence on a secured lock unit and frequently that, that violence is um, in relationship to uh, staff, you know, putting people in restraint or forcing medication. You know, it's a far scarier feeling to be, you know, on a locked ward where, where you have given up so much uh, control over your life. And even when you have the right to refuse medication, it can still get forced on you. So that, to me, that's a way more violent environment. So for say, having a clinician is going to prevent violence or being on a locked unit is going to prevent violence. That's, that's just not the experience. Or if you look at the numbers of what happens on locked units, it's really different than in a peer respite. So there's a bunch of other questions. Some of them were, are going to come up in uh, some of the slides we have to go through, but do you, maybe we can take a couple more out of this box now. One, the next one I'm seeing, Cindy, is about how we get quote unquote referrals. And I'll just start us off by saying we, we really are intentional in not using language of the cl clinical system wherever we can. So we don't use the language of referral, uh, but Cindy, can you talk more about how sure. it does the, um, you know, we, we have a presence in the community as a Western Mass RLC, so there's a lot of word of mouth, but we're really clear to tell people, you know, somebody says, you know, I think I know someone who could benefit from a FIA, you know, I will say, oh, well, give them the number and have them call, or, or if they would like to talk to me about it, I'll talk to them, but it's not about, um, you know, this is part of how we avoid uh, violence is uh, the, the, the coercion's not there. You know, people self-determine, you know, there's a conversation about this is, you know, what being at a fee is like. Does that fit into something that might sound helpful to you? Not, oh, my therapist told me I had to go. Or, you know, my family's telling me I have to go. You know, it's just such a, a, a different footing to walk into a place around. I don't know if you have more to fill out on that. We, we have a website. Uh, we, do, we do a lot of education and trainings to get the word out. We also have a peer support line. You know, so there's many different ways that somebody might find out about AFIA. We, when I have gone and done these groups on uh, inpatient units, you know, we'll share information about AFIA. For, for myself, you know, I I was trained that if I feel a certain way, I need to be in the hospital. But then to learn that, you know, maybe there's another alternative, it was like a new thing for me to learn. So, you know, we try to get out the word that way. And we, you know, this is sometimes a point of conflict with providers who think that they should be able to call and say, oh, this person needs this. And um, we really push back on that, even if honestly there are formal referral paperwork forms sent to us. I'll tell you what we tend to do with those formal referral paperwork forms, and it doesn't thrill providers. We pick it up, we see it, we hand it to the person, <laughs> and we're done with it. Uh, we don't really want those. We will talk with people on someone's behalf if the person themselves really wants us to, but people are so used to signing off on referral and, and uh, release paperwork that we still see it as really, really important that we support people to be a part of that conversation that is about themselves and not just take that over just because we receive the form. So we will generally push back on providers and say that we are absolutely willing to tell them about what we offer, but that we really need to talk to that person. And in fact, not just that person, but that person without them present in the room. In terms yeah, we of what kinda, going on we, Sometimes people will say, you know, call up and say, how is so-and-so doing? And uh, I will say, oh, you should try asking them how they're doing. 
yeah you know and uh so that that is the whole idea to you know as it's in that film about respect you know re to respect the person enough to have a conversation with them about how they feel about how things are going all right so Cindy, is it okay if I just run through some quick answers to some of the other sure. quicker questions and then maybe we can get to through the slide so we can get back to maybe open questions here. So I saw one about pay rate and that's a great question. The question was about, are we paying people enough to really leave other jobs? And it's a struggle. And I would say one thing to all of you who are not in a place where you've done this yet, start as high as you can with pay rates advocate for as high as you can because once it's rolling it's really hard to change at that point we got put in a position where we absolutely are hiring people at a lower rate than we'd like to be and that's really hard uh, it was based on funding based on our like real drive in the community to get a peer respite going even if we had to cut corners but it puts us in a position where it is hard to sustain people who really are good at and want to be doing this work and Right now, our, our pay scale, like once someone has all the uh, core trainings that they're required to have for doing this work, they're getting 1550 as the starting hourly wage. Bear in mind, we're in Western Mass and our cost of living is relatively low compared to big cities. So that's where we're at. And it's not enough. We have leadership people who are making more, but it's hard. So bear that in mind. Uh, as far as funding, our primary funding is coming from the Department of Mental Health. So it's state funding, peer respites across the country vary. There are some that are getting Medicaid reimbursement, which is really, really complicated. I want you to just be aware that anytime you take funding from a system that says you have to uh, be within a medical concept of disease and things like that, that there's gonna be a lot of strings. There's some people have found some creative ways around that, but it's a real challenge if you can avoid those kinds of strings. Some are getting federal SAMHSA funding or at least did for a period of time. Some are getting private donor funding. I would encourage you if you're thinking about starting a peer respite as much as possible to have at least a couple of funding sources, even if one is quite small, because that allows you to do things like oh, we're not doing that thing you don't like on your dollars, we're doing it on the other people's dollars. So you can just kind of go like, no, it's, it's that person's money. And that can create some more flexibility. I do I just want to, fine. I wanted to add quickly about who goes to AFIA. And um, something that we've discovered is that if somebody is working in a clinical role, sometimes they need support too. And it's a place where, uh, it's not insurance based. So somebody, uh, we've actually had people from uh, different parts of the state who were, were feeling burnt out or, or needed a break, but they didn't want to go to their employer and say that because they were afraid that they would be a uh, judge not able to do their job or looked at differently when they came back. And uh, they've come to a FIA, uh, college students, have come to us via because if they go to the college and say I'm having a hard time sometimes you know their parents get involved they get uh, disenrolled from school so instead they can come and and do their studies and not be in a dorm environment or not be a, you know overwhelmed and just take care of the business they need to take care of versus ending up in the mental health system which might totally derail their academic career. So there's lots of different kinds of people who go there. Yeah, and just to build on that a little bit, Elisa, you had asked uh, if it's more of a home for people who are working in peer roles. Certainly there are people who are working in peer roles who end up there, but that's certainly not the majority of people who end up there. It is, you know, as Cindy said, a, a wide range of people. And honestly, as much as possible, we love to get to young people who haven't entered the system yet because going to somewhere like here when you're a college student, say, instead of starting your path on the, in the mental health system, if you're not already there, can sometimes be exactly what someone needs to interrupt getting stuck in the system in the first place. But that said, we also see lots of people who have been in the system for a long time and that we work with 
around, you know, what have you learned based on being in the system that maybe could actually be different? How is it working for you as you move through the world? It's really anybody who's 18 or over who is trying to avoid hospital or some other, uh, you know, bigger, less desirable intervention, just really struggling in their life, a real range of people, whether they're struggling with suicide or hearing distressing voices, any number of other things. And I, before we get to the slides, the one last thing I just want to mention is also that we do not necessarily subscribe to, I don't, I think peer respites vary around drug use. I'll say that. So there was a comment in the chat box about federal dollars and not being able to be, have drugs in your system. We don't subscribe to that. It is a challenge. We do ask people not to have drug paraphernalia or be using in the house. Uh, we ask people if they do come back to the house smelling of alcohol or weed or what have you to not be in the common spaces so as to not impact the rest of the house. And we might ask someone to leave if it's like a constant thing and they just seem to be going out and, and using and, and not really, you know, also using the house for what it's intended. But we absolutely have people in the house at times who have something in their system. We aren't trying to play detective and figure out that. We understand that people are using that as coping a lot of the time. And we just really try and work with people within our values and how they're impacting each other and how, how they're moving through the world is, is working for them. So again, I think this, this is that, this really varies. So we're gonna come back to some of the other questions. I just wanna get through some of these slides because I think some of them will answer some of your questions and we'll come back to questions. So we do have this book that's available and you can get it free online or you can get a hard copy off of Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Uh, Cindy or Katie, if you could put the links in the chat box for people around the, both the free and the paid version of the book. So you can see that it, the image to the right on the slide is of that book. But within that book is a charter. And the charter talks about three different types of respite that involve people in peer roles. One is a fully peer run respite, which is where Athea sits. Another is a hybrid peer respite, which is where Second Story, for example, sits. And we're gonna talk a little bit about Second Story because they've done a fair amount of research on the impact of peer respite. And what that hybrid basically means is that they tend to sit under a clinical organization or have one or more other pieces that just don't quite meet the standard of fully peer run respite. For example, uh, you know, maybe they are in a more clinical setting or building or, you know, there's other things that you'll see on the charter, which we're also going to send you a link to in a moment. And then the, the peer integrated respite sounds kind of similar to what y'all were saying about the pack houses. We were thinking of the community access respites in New York and some of the other respites around the country where there's a pretty strong presence of peer support and some of the values of peer respite are present. But for example, the community access peer respites in New York do not require by definition that their leadership have their own experience with diagnosis or hospital or trauma or anything like that. So for that reason, they move into the peer integrated respite rather than being an actual peer respite. That's just one example. Some of the things that you will see on the charter, and at this point, I just want to ask Cindy or Katie if you could send the charter link into the chat box, are, are some of the things that are represented here on this, this slide. And I don't think that any of it will be a shock to most of you, but it, it includes things like no or minimal paperwork, avoiding power imbalances, uh, no required schedule. Now, I think some peer respites vary a little bit, but I will say at Athea, it's been really important that we not expect everyone to be following a schedule, the same schedule every week or even within the same week, all the people who are there necessarily wanting to do the same things at the same time. It's a really self-guided and you know, supported environment where people can figure out what they actually need based on where they're at. Really important also, able to come and go freely. I was at one point on a call with a place that was saying that they were a peer respite and they, we were talking about how we deal with drug challenges, you know, drugs in the house um, and challenges of coming, people coming back high. And they said, well, you know, the way we deal with it is no one can leave except if they're with their case manager. 
And, and that immediately told me that, okay, this isn't quite a peer respite because there just aren't those restrictions. There has to be kind of a foundation of trust that people are operating from in order for it to qualify as a, a peer respite. Now, there's one in here that is red. It's human everyday language, and it's linked closely with the one that's just above it, no routine focus on diagnosis. So why we say that's important and really fundamental to something qualifying as a peer respite is because, you know, people walk through this world and they're so used to getting told what's wrong with them, what they need to do about it, and what it's called, and not supported to explore what that actually means for them. And if you go back to what we were talking about earlier around the importance of power and control, that is frankly one of the places that people lose power and control in their life when they enter the mental health system is, is, is being told all those things. And I, I wanna say like in some ways, this ends up replicating the trauma a lot of us have experienced. So I, I'm often one, someone who, when I'm in an environment where the language of non-compliance, for example, is getting used, I'll say like that is, violent language that is replicating trauma. And I say that because as a kid, when I experienced some of the sexual and physical and emotional abuse that I experienced, it was because someone who had power over me was telling me what I was supposed to be doing, that I was bad if I didn't do it, you know, all those different pieces. And then I enter a system that is supposed to help me move through that trauma and the impact it has had on me. And basically I get told the same thing and I get told, you know, basically that it's, it's my fault, it's something about me that's going on. And so we just, we put it in red because we can't emphasize enough how important it is in a peer respite environment that people be supported to figure out what this all means for them. And that doesn't mean that that's easy. It doesn't mean when we say that someone's an expert on themselves, it doesn't mean that they come with all the answers on the surface but it does mean that we construct these environments of peer respite and, and frankly, many other peer support environments. And if I'm honest, I think even clinical environments, if they were doing their job as well as they could, that we construct these environments to support people to figure out the answers they have within that have been layered over by a lot of other jobs. I'm not, it, it's always harder when we're in these online environments to sort of just check in with people to see if you uh, if I'm making sense but I can see some of you am I making sense <laughs> to those of you I can see overall I think so okay all right so I know we're just kind of giving you a taste in this hour and a half that we have but I wanted to give you a taste of research as a part of this because research you know research is tough in peer-to-peer -peer environments for a number of reasons, because a lot of us have histories of being used by research, of having our expertise taken but not be compensated for that, while high paid people are taking our, our knowledge and using it for their own advantage, or just you know having things tested out on us without real informed consent. So research is difficult and we tend to avoid a lot of kind of the invasive research approaches that get used, but there has been some good research out there. And one of them, one of the research papers on peer respite just came out at the end of June. And there's a link to it at the bottom of the slide that you'll see. And this is just a quote for it. So, and I see it as a quote, a quote that really supports the idea of the values of the charter. So it says, studies, study findings suggest there are some key ingredients for peer respites, including a home-like environment of voluntary and self-determined supports and peer staff members who possess the capacity for developing healing and genuine connections with guests while also promoting shared responsibility and self-reliance. And for those of you who are looking to either shift the peer respite that you're connected to or build a new one, I would hang on to some of this research stuff that's going out there because when you have a clinician, you have a provider saying, oh, this couldn't possibly work, or you know, sometimes with the best of intentions, thinking they know what it's supposed to look like but not understanding what they don't know. These kinds of research studies that outline what is most useful and what has seen the best outcomes are gonna be really, really important for you. So just some other uh, just general outcome research for Athea that we're gonna let you know about, and we'll go back to questions in a few minutes. 
And again, you'll see in the upper right corner where you can go to look at these reports in full. So in FY17, the, what we saw in our house, and some of this is based on the size of the fee, which is three bedrooms, as the film mentioned, we saw 174 total stays and 107 separate individuals. So that meant that there were some people who were coming through repeatedly, you know, more than once anyway, and, but a lot of new people. And those new people, again, ran all sorts of ages uh, and experiences. This is also an important one. Reasons people didn't stay out of FIA. I want to point out that 990 of the contacts we had where someone wanted to stay and did not result in a stay was because we had no space. Now, this is also important to those of you who are trying to start a respiratory thing in particular. We keep getting measured uh, in terms of our efficacy against hospitals and other places. The reality is, however, in order for our efficacy to be truly measured, we would need to have as much capacity <laughs> as some of those places. In order to be effective as, say, hospital diversion, we would need to have enough bedrooms, enough spaces for people to be able to be immediately ready to take someone in, like the ER is, like the hospital is. And they're not funding us at that level. So even though we have this one three bedroom house, I would say we really haven't been able to fully realize the impact of what having hospital diversion here would be like because our capacity is so limited. So please bear that in mind. It is also not an argument to have say a house with 20 bedrooms because that really changes the energy. It is really more an argument just that we need lots of, of peer respites. We, you know, in a in a perfect world, there would be at least as many peer respites as there are acute hospital units, and we aren't even coming close to touching that right now. So when people look to efficacy, I think it's important that you remind them that the results have been really great so far, but not fully realized because you're not funding us in order to fully realize it. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but you can certainly go back and look at the full reports. We just wanted to give you a sense that we do do our own outcome measures by survey. They are voluntary. Not everyone fills them out, but when they do, we pretty consistently see that both clinical respite and hospitals actually measure fairly similarly in terms of people's experience of being treated with dignity, addressing injustice, being helpful overall, et cetera. And then peer respite, at least where it is concerned, comes out significantly higher in terms of those measures, which we see is, you know, just being essential to actually impact people in the positive ways we're, we're attempting to impact them. We also asked people what was most helpful about their stay. And one of the things I want to point out here, really highlight, is the accomplished goals. Now, it's not the highest one in FY 2017. It was in the top five, I think, the two years before that. But it is pretty high. About 60% of people said it was most helpful to be at FIA in terms of the support they got to accomplish their goals. And the reason I highlight that one pretty consistently when I talk about peer respite is because we do not have treatment plans. We do not have required goals. We do not have people that sit down and do notes on your goal progress every day. We just don't do that. And so I see this as evidence of how sometimes a really flexible environment that does not have these artificial ways of forcing goals on people sometimes are actually more helpful to people actually getting what feeling like they accomplished something. So I think that's again a really important point for all of you as you move forward that that piece around control, power, self-determination is just so key in how these spaces operate. Long-term improvements, these are, get even harder to measure because again, it's by survey and we tend to get an even smaller number of people filling out things six months after they leave versus like right as they're leaving. So it's challenging, but we do see a reduction in hospitalization. We do see people saying their emotional well-being has significantly improved. In fact, you'll see that almost everybody who fills out that later survey says that you know, connections and emotional health have improved and then fewer hospitalizations comes right after that. Now, not everyone who's ever been in peer respite has necessarily previously been hospitalized. So we're only looking at people who have been hospitalized when we look at that data. So if you're doing your own data measurements, you know, I'd absolutely encourage you to check in with places like Live and Learn, run by Alicia Ostrow and others 
that have a real investment in research that is led by people who've been there themselves. All right, so a couple of final thoughts on formal research, and then we're going to um, go to you all back with the questions that are in chat and that you might still have to offer. So this is a coming out of a paper from 2015. It is looking at second story, in particular second story is in is Santa Cruz, California, and they are, as I mentioned earlier, a hybrid peer respite. But nonetheless, some of the most intensive research that was done and for what it's worth, I will say, because it was a hybrid peer respite that was only accepting people who were already in their mental health system, it made it easier for them to do the research. So I'm grateful for that, even though I ultimately would advocate for fully peer run respites. So this just says, looking at guests who stayed at the peer run second story, any point between May 2011 and December 2014, we found that even a short stay significantly reduced the number of hours of subsequent emergency and inpatient services. Now, that's important. It is not as important as the system is going to tell you it is. The system gets a little obsessed sometimes with whether or not someone's ever like going to be back in the hospital. And I would say actually, and I've seen even psychiatrists like Sandy Steingard say things like, you know what? What, if, if someone, say, goes in the hospital once a year, but the rest of the year they're living a full life, is that not much better than someone who's, say, really heavily drugged, <laughs> but staying out of the hospital, but not able to do much because of how heavily drugged they are? You know, so sometimes there's a balance. And, you know, that's not an argument against using any kinds of psychiatric drugs, but I'm sure you've all seen that sometimes people come out of hospitals or other environments so heavily drugged that they just kind of are on the couch, right? And that's not necessarily the ideal either. The other piece came out, comes out of that article that I mentioned earlier, uh, the 2020 article that just got released, also focused on second story. And um, I'll read this and then I'll be done reading to you. The provision of mutual support in an environment that fosters mutuality and equality between guests and peer staff may improve quality of life and enhance social connections while also preventing the need for more costly and undesirable inpatient and emergency services. Additionally, for many individuals, the peer respite can facilitate the experience of a psychiatric crisis as an opportunity for inter and intrapersonal growth. So, we ran through a lot of information. I'm going to go back to chat, whatever you have been putting in, uh, and uh, and whatever might come after it. It's a little hard to track, as you know, if you've been on this end of things, there's a a lot of things going into the chat. Um, so I see someone looking for the link that was on the last slide, and, and we'll get that in there shortly. Um, do, do we have folks that leave not feeling helped? Absolutely. Yes. There's like, I, I, I will pay you millions of dollars that I don't actually have, but I'll say I'll pay you millions of dollars if you can come to me with the one support that will help everybody. I don't know that it exists. What I think, you know, in a system that was actually functioning in a way that I think would actually be helpful, we have a number of options. Peer respite is not the only one. Peer respite, I think, is a really important one, and it should be available enough that people can use it if they want to. But I would also say Soteria House is another model that's really great if you have had access to it. Soteria, there's some Soterias around. There's been one in Vermont, Alaska, Israel. You can go around, you can Google it. It's a longer term setting that is designed for people who are experiencing their first uh, crisis and really with that intent I mentioned earlier of having people not go into getting stuck in the system. So that's one example. I think we could come up with so many different alternatives if we had access to even a fraction of the funding that goes into these systems to continue what so many of us know is, is really not effective for most of us. So what I can say is the efficacy, like people tend to be much more satisfied, but not everybody. And sometimes that's about what we offer. Sometimes that's about people actually wanting more structure. And sometimes it's just about like you get two people in the house who really don't get along and it just doesn't work, you know? So for any number of reasons, sometimes it does not 
end up happening. Uh, okay, so I'm going to look more. Cindy, do you want to take a question? Sure. Um, and I, I do want to say what I hear far more than, a, oh, I didn't like my stay at a FIA, what I hear far more is, I wish I didn't have to leave. I wish I could stay longer. That That is a, a much more uh, commonly heard uh, a statement from people. And it, it, it is not, you know, there were questions about substance use and I will say, you know, it, it is not, um, the design of it is not that of a sober house. And, and I can say that it, uh, a couple of different scenarios or situations where somebody came in and they smelt like alcohol and uh, the, the person working there just said, could you please take a shower? You know, it's, it's, it's not about judging uh, whether people, uh, you know, it's not based on uh, judging people for, for being an adult and drinking. It's more like, how do we create a supportive space for people who don't want to be around the smell of alcohol? You know, so it's more of that mindset. How do we be respectful of everybody who's staying in the house? But it is, it is certainly not, um, you know, the, the um, abstinence model. But, but myself, you know, I'm somebody who, you know, it's important for me not to drink or, or drug and, and I felt fully supported in that house. But, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, that was me telling them what I needed for support and that's what I got. But it's not about policing people, drug testing people, and, uh, and it's way more about how people treat each other. Yeah, uh, a couple of other questions. So I see one clarification in terms of people who are not helped. And yeah, we do ask people for feedback on ways that we can change and we have made changes over time. One of the questions on the you know survey that people can fill right as they're leaving is, you know, are there things they didn't like and that they would have us change? And sometimes it's things we can't change like, uh, the house was too noisy. Yeah, I wish the walls were, were thicker. I'm not sure we can do too much about that. Or, you know, sometimes it, it are, is things that we can change. Like, could you support me to have more notice of, or a reminder oh. of like, sorry, go ahead. I can remember asking for some kind of exercise equipment. Can we have like a exercise bike? And, uh, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, can we have, uh, you know, musical instruments or different art supplies or this, when we first opened, this was a big deal was food. You know, can we have different kinds of food in here? Because depending on, you know, depending both on a budget that was not great for food and, you know, having people coming from different communities and different cultures, you know, the, the request for different kinds of food certainly came up. And, uh, but, you know, that, you know, to even be asked, to even be asked, you know, what, you know, what do you think, you know, would uh, improve a FIA? You know, when I've gone to the hospital, you know, I've not gotten that survey usually. Or, or even if I did, I don't think anybody read it. But this idea of how can we improve what happens here and to be asked is amazing. Yeah, and we, you know, sometimes it is about like a team member who's just not handled something in the way that worked for somebody and we can grow with that, whether it's, you know, that the person is not also uh, doing their job in the way that we expect or just a way to learn uh, what might be useful. One of the things that really was struggled with for a while was people really didn't want to bother people who were in their rooms because they didn't want, you know, again, we have this like, you don't have to do anything in particular at any given time until you have a lot of flexibility. But sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between someone who really wants to be left alone because they're trying to catch up on sleep or whatever else, and someone who's just not sure how to connect. And so we really had to do a lot of work as a team of like, when do you reach out? When do you create an open door or a connection? And when do you just give someone your space? And that's definitely been something we've learned a lot about through feedback from people in the house as well. So there was a question about homeless people yeah, without yeah. housing. And so, um, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, so officially, uh, 
it, we are not allowed by the funder to take people who do not have a place to go to when they leave. And so sometimes though people come and they find a better place to go to when they leave than what they had before they came in. You know, or yeah, sometimes okay. that that is a good decision for somebody to to go in there and then go to, you know, uh, you know, a different kind of a living situation than what they came from. Yeah, and I just I want to clarify that a little further, sitting ready, because that's not like so. Initially, they put that in our contract, and then initially they said we could ignore it, and then they put it back in our contract when we had to re-bid, and then we tried to get them to ignore it again, and then they said no, and then they said yes. Like, we've been all over the place, and frankly, we just kind of ignore them. You know, at this point, like, we absolutely, you know, are, and we put it in writing, we don't, like, make a real, uh, we don't try to hide it. We basically tell people, you can't come here strictly because you're home, like living on the street without a house. Uh, that can't be the only reason because that would, you know, there was a main peer respite that ended up shutting down. One of the reasons was because they ended up really having people there that were there because they had no house to go back to, no home. And it ended up going too far off the mission. So we, we tried to to keep to that mission, but there are, there's, you know, one of the really good reasons to end up in emotional distress, one of the really common reasons anyway, is when you don't have your basic needs met. There are absolutely people living on the street that we have come through there who, you know, the things that we make sure of, we make sure that they know that at the end of the week, they're still not going to have a place most likely. We'll do our best if we can support them, but most places don't have most areas do not have housing that will be available in a week's time. So we make sure that they know that even if that's still the case, that they can't stay longer, that this is not about fixing that. It is about supporting them to figure out what we could accomplish in a week. And then they absolutely can come in. I, I just want to share for me, I had had a, a situation involving drugs and alcohol. I had blown up where I lived. I had ended up in a hospital. I had no place to go. And uh, I went to a FIA and, uh, you know, I, I have a whatever. I was blessed because between people and the community and whatnot, I spent my week there. I got my head together and did have a place. You know, people helped me find a place that I could uh, leave and go to that I could call my own. So sometimes it works out well. But in any event, to have this place to uh, spend a week to try to make a plan and think about life when you're not being constantly interrupted by just trying to survive can be really helpful. Yeah, there was a question about how we foster connection after someone leaves. Now, we did not start with this, but we did a couple of years ago add a bridger. So there is a bridger who, if someone say is on the wait list to come in, we do keep a wait list of, you know, the wait list is as long as the number of bedrooms that we have so that you know, the longest the wait would be would be about a week, so that's really not ideal. <laughs> um, and so the bridger can support someone who's on a wait list by meeting up with them, talking to them on the phone, et cetera, helping them figure out how to sustain. And then they can also support them after they've left, for about a month after they've left, to visit resources in the community if they want that support or just stay connected. And then there are some peer respites that are just peer respites not connected to a larger community or a broader organization with other supports, but we're not one of them. So we really benefit from the fact that even while people are at the respite, they're learning about the things that we offer in the rest of our community, the community centers, the groups, the things like that. And they're able to, in some instances, go with someone who works at the peer respite to a group and get connected there before they've left. And so as much as possible, we try to do those sorts of things. We are down to our last few minutes, and I know that there are questions that we've missed, but I'm wondering if there's, you know, something really pressing uh, that someone wants to, to get out there, rather than watching me scroll through the questions for things I've missed. You could even just speak it out loud. That would probably be quicker. Maybe we've, we've covered it all. <laughs> We're good. All right. So I'm going to put my 
email in the uh, chat box so that if people do have questions after this, they can contact us. Cindy, are you okay with me putting yours yeah. there as well? You'll notice a trend with our emails which is that they're basically our first names at westernmassrlc.org. So it's usually pretty easy to figure out as long as you can, as long as you know the spelling of our name. So <laughs> feel free to be in touch with us with more questions. And I hope that you got useful information out of this. And I wish all of you, particularly those of you who are looking to start your respites in your area, the best of luck with that. <laughs>